Hello and welcome to day three and the fifth and final session of the 24th Biennial General Conference of the Association of Asian Social Science Research Councils. My name is Michelle Bruce and I'm the Secretary General of ASREC. The topic of this year's ASREC conference is navigating the future with and after COVID-19, the role of social sciences in Asia. And it's being hosted and convened by the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. It is customary in Australia to offer an acknowledgement of country at the beginning of a meeting, speech or event. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are joining this event from today. And we will do this with a brief video presentation. Wherever you are across Australia, we acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians, custodians of, of this land. land. The Darug peoples. The Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. The, the Gundungurra, Gundungurra people of the Southern, Southern Highlands. The Ngunnawal people of the Canberra region on whose country we are standing. And all other peoples of this vast continent. Their ongoing connection through custodianship of its land and waters. Physical and spiritual through culture, language and ceremony. Where sovereignty was never ceded, we pay our respects to elders past, present and still to come. Thank you. The ASREC Secretariat is located on Ngunnawal land in Canberra, and that's where I'm joining you from today. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, for those of you who weren't able to join us on day one and two of the conference, I'm going to run through a few housekeeping matters before we begin the presentations in session five. Uh, this session will consist of 15 minute presentations from each of the presenters. And following the presentations, we'll hold a Q&A session with all of the panelists. If you'd like to ask the presenters a question, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we also encourage you to use the chat section to any, enter any comments you may have on the presentations. Please note that this event is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the ASREC website after the conference. And just to clarify, we won't be recording the participants, we will only be recording the presentations. It is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of our fifth session, Professor Christopher Gregory. Professor Gregory is an Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at the College of Arts and Social Sciences at the Australian National University, and he's a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. Over to you, Professor Gregory. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, well, welcome everybody to session five the role of social science in understanding and responding to pandemics. Um, and welcome to all the speakers. And we'd like to start off firstly with a, 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 two speakers, Dr. Roshan Fekra, who's an assistant professor in social welfare management research center at the University of Social Welfare and Rehabilitation Sciences in Tehran. He's also a member of the board of directors of the Iranian Sociological Association. And as also, he may not be here, he has to be teaching, but uh, the presentation will be made by Omar Hatimi, who specializes in systemic inequality and exclusion of disenfranchised groups, particularly women from policy making processes. Currently, she works as freelance researcher in the field of medical anthropology, maternal and reproductive health and gender equality. The title of their paper is Social Science in Pandemics, Lessons Learned from the Past and Some Ideas for the Present. Thank you. Okay, so hello and good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I am pleased to stop this panel with a story about a chain of failures uh, I'm sure everyone here is already familiar with the first part of this story. The great global system first failed its first big test, COVID-19. And now I am sharing my presentation. <laughs> 
Even though there were always a group of, let's say, pessimist authors that kept warning us about an upcoming apocalypse, be it the climate crisis or a larger scale unconquerable disease, most of us were caught off guard. COVID-19 shook our societies from top to bottom. For the first time, the outbreak was not limited to some faraway region in the world. The decision makers who were only used to preventing a disease from entering their territory now had to face a pandemic within their borders. They were forced to make the impossible decision between the immediate need to contain the pandemic and their long-term commitments to sustain economy and ensure the socio-psychological well-being of the population. The limited scientific knowledge about the virus at the beginning of the pandemic and its relatively long incubation period only added to the complications. At the same time as the initial evaluations demonstrate in numerous countries, industries in the primary, secondary and tertiary sectors have all been hardly hit by the pandemic. The pressure on banking industry and other microfinance institutions has risen as a result of sudden increase in demand for loans and turnovers. Various governments have been forced to consider lofty rescue packages to cushion the impacts of pandemic and financial markets. Simultaneously, uncoordinated governmental response has led to serious disruptions in supply chain. Specifically, food distribution and retail sector have been confounded by an unprecedented increase in demand, partly as a result of panic buying and hoarding. Uh, unfortunately, as the majority of the studies are still focused on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on high-income countries, the consequences for the brutal economy of low- and mi middle-income countries, particularly in the disenfranchised group and those in precarious jobs, has yet to be thoroughly evaluated, although the first reports are not really promising. And as if we did not have enough in our plates, the cumulative effects of land use policies and austerity measures came back to slap us in the face. We suddenly noticed that thanks to years of neoliberal policies, we have exhausted our line of credit. The gentrification and rising house values are directly related to other COVID-19 risk factors such as homelessness, crowded housing and employment in jobs that cannot be done remotely. At the same time, years of constructing urban regions as places of peace and leisure came back in the form of massive immigration from large cities to small rural areas that already had weak health infrastructures and inadequate supply chain networks. A movement that first and foremost hurt rural populations, especially First Nation peoples. Also, as healthcare workers from all over the world had been repeatedly warning us, no amount of hypocritical movements like clap for carers could compensate for the cumulative impacts of privatization of care and austerity measures such as cutting wages and decreasing the number of intensive care beds and ventilators. As healthcare systems all over the globe were on the verge of crashing, only countries like Germany that were previously criticized for their unnecessary high expenditure in healthcare sector were able to survive the first waves of pandemic. And now that we are talking about lack of resources and weakened infrastructures, let's remind ourselves that at the beginning of the pandemic, we kept hearing that we were all on the same boat, but we were soon shaken out of our reverie as we realized we were under the same storm, but definitely not on the same boat. As the initial studies pointed out, morbidity and mortality rates were directly related to country's income level, while even countries such as the United States were struggling with the shortage of ventilators and critical care beds. Such luxuries were almost non-existent in countries such as Sierra Leone, Kenya and Malawi. The picture becomes even more bleak if we remember the, uh, the countries with the most brutal infrastructures were already dealing with weak welfare systems and the aftermath of previous pandemics and now they had to enter an unfair fight with all those big powers to secure life-saving resources. A real free market. 
Even in high-income countries, the direct relationship between poverty, race, precarious work, and living conditions and disability showed once again that one's zip code was more important than one's genetic code. And while those under the protection of the state were clutching onto their rickety boats, there were those who had nothing to hold on to, including the stateless or displaced people and undocumented migrants. Although some keep calling COVID-19 pandemic a black swan event, I think it was quite the opposite. We definitely cannot claim that we were not warned. If anything, the recurrent occurrence of epidemics such as SARS, MERS, Zika, and 1H1N and Ebola since the beginning of the 21st century should have made us realize that the emergence of a larger scale global pandemic is not a matter of if, but when. Just like Robert Wallace warned us in 2016, our industrial production system was also actively producing our eventual demise. At the same time, those of us in social sciences were already well aware of the disastrous impacts of neoliberal policies and the population health status. And some of us even had the first hand experience of uh, struggling with poor health infrastructure and lack of re resources on the ground during disease outbreaks, such as cholera, Zika, Ebola, and yellow fever. We sure came across numerous complaints from anthropologists that while people in the impacted regions were busy coming up with innovative ways to survive an epidemic, the enforced, uncoordinated, and parallel actions of various local, national, and international bodies did nothing more than complicating the situation and even adding to the casualties. After all, we did and saw, we knew we had to come up with standardized social science-based response mechanisms before the next big pandemic strikes. But why everything went so wrong? That is where the second part of my story starts, when me and my colleague decided to embark on our own grand journey and find the answer to this question. At the time, the only thing we knew was that we already knew too much. Uh, we had an unimaginable grand pool of knowledge about pandemics and social determinants of health. And thanks to countless studies, conferences, and magazine issues dedicated to COVID-19, what we knew was grow growing like wildfire. So we decided to move in the opposite direction. Our main goal was to look back at the almost chaotic body of knowledge on COVID-19 and find a harmony to identify the gaps and suggest more constructive directions for future researchers. We conducted a semi-structured review on 1,317 papers that were published at 2020 in peer-reviewed magazines. In order to summarize our findings, we tried different models and finally decided to settle for a rather straightforward one. The one suggested by Boraway in his famous 2004 presidential address. In his model, Borway tries to draw lines between different types of knowledge, uh, sociological labor, dividing them into four subgroups, as you can see, based on various factors, including the knowledge they produce, the audience they address, and their political inclinations. According to him, while professional sociologists were concerned with producing theories and methods, those giving advice to policymakers looked for practical and useful knowledge. On the other hand, some sociologists were eager to go back to the public roots of sociology or offer critical insights about the discipline itself. Applying Barbara's model to our findings provided us with a very interesting insight about the social sciences and their potential to counter a crisis. After all, it was one of the rare occasions that everyone was focusing on the same issue from their own perspective. Some took a professional approach to probe the link between morbidity, morbidity and mortality rates of the disease in culture, poverty, race, and genders. Others went a step further to pose critical questions regarding the relationship between the pandemic and the role of women as caregivers, domestic violence, precarious labor arrangements, and austerity measures. There were those who advised policymakers on the pros and cons of different communication methods and 
and controlling the spread of misinformation, while others went among people to learn about the ways each community used to contain the contagion. Yet, we came across even more works that were impossible to, play, to be placed under one category, authors who offered policy responses that were a mixture of top-down and bottom-up approaches. There were professional studies that borrowed from public insights and critical concepts kept being brought up as authors warned politicians, their peers and the general public about the climate of fear that was being used to announce a state of expectation and leg legitimize drastic measures such as restrictions on movement and increasing and increased policing of citizens. Our work is still in progress. Thanks to our initial observations, we face new questions. Is COVID-19 the wake-up call we were waiting for? Are we finally ready to accept the fact that whether we like it or not, we live in a global society and we have to put aside our personal, national, and regional interests to solve the issues that the global system keeps throwing at us? Are we looking at another turn in social sciences or is it just the temporary disruption of the old order that has brought us uh, closer? Personally, I hope it is the former case. After all, as the global politics keeps moving more and more to the right, we need a stronger community that insists on the importance of tackling issues like the coming climate crisis and the increasing global inequality. In the meantime, we can only hope that it is not too late for the sci social sciences to remember their original purpose and go back to the public groups. And now my presentation is over. So thank you everyone for your time and attention. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Right on time and a very interesting talk which raises lots of questions. And I just remind the visitors, the to uh, look, put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll come to them after the next two speakers. Uh, our next speakers uh, are Dr. Inaya Ramani. She is the inaugural director of the Asia Research Center in the Faculty of Social and Political Science at the University of Indonesia and the deputy director of the Science and Education Working Group of the Indonesian Young Academy of Sciences. She will be speaking along with Dr. Panji Anugra. He's a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at the University of Indonesia and a research fellow in the Asia Research Center, also at the University of Indonesia. The title of their talk and, um, is Social Inequality Within the Research System in Responding to COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Chris. I'm going to turn on my alarm so uh, we don't go over time, but Elna's your presentation uh, and your grounding on Burroway is actually the basis, uh, theoretical basis for our paper. Uh, so having you explain that part certainly made it very much easier for us to latch on to your arguments and expand and compare with the Southeast Asian context. So in solidarity. Uh, firstly, Picking up on Borowe's argument uh, about public sociology, we were fully aware that we as social scientists are very much part of the neoliberal governance uh, that has caused an exacerbation of disenfranchisement of people already in vulnerable positions. And we as academics in public universities, private universities, think tanks are also complicit in the reproduction of social inequalities. Historically, especially in Southeast Asia, our education, higher education system and research systems were inherited from our Dutch, French, British, Portuguese colonialists. And many of our intellectuals were also part and parcel of the intellectual um, apparatus that supported either imperialism or state authoritarianism. Uh, I am, we are not here speaking on behalf of our colleagues, uh, but I hope we do them justice in terms of trying to synthesize the main argument that capture all of our concerns. And we begin with an alliance between uh, academics. Uh, we try as much as we can to mobilize resources within our institutions and the immaterial conditions in which we are able to speak our minds uh, as we mean to say, not as our institutions 
request us to achieve. Uh, we are here uh, on behalf of representing our colleagues from Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Timor-Leste, and also Bangladesh. And a, spe a special note for Professor Kianun from uh, NTU, Teresa Tadam from UPCIDS, and Rosalia Scortino from Mahadol and Si Junction, who have been excellent brainstorming partners to look at these phenomenons more theoretically. We look at uh, the pandemic as an extension of and the worsening of neoliberal changes. So we fully agree with Elnaz's presentation when she mentions free markets, when she mentions the privatization of basic services. We fully agree with that assessment and we problematize the way regime changes in Southeast Asia and state governance. Uh, relates with civil society and critical social sciences in providing information, uh, keeping the government accountable, as well as allying with our partners in civil society movements. We look at the pandemic as a historical context in which um, uh, wealth, pre-existing wealth and social inequalities are brought to the surface and made more complex because of the social elements of the marginalized and disenfranchised that go along the lines of gender, ethnicity, religion, race, class, and many other contextual um, experiences that we can never do justice in 15 to 20 minutes. We also problematized, as Elnaz has presented, the paradigmatic inequalities within social sciences and also beyond. There is a privileging of generalization, statistical modeling, epidemiology approaches to find a predictive model so that the state can respond quicker to the needs of as many people as possible. At the same time, though, immersive social sciences that try to understand those most those made most vulnerable during the pandemic, meaning vital workers, meaning sanitation workers, health workers, on what Elnas mentions as those who are precarious and made even more precarious during the pandemic, are largely unheard of in policy making. In the case of social sciences in Southeast Asia, we'd like to take the case of Indonesia and Malaysia because it's really difficult to be able to synthesize very different hist historical trajectories and different experience uh, along these lines of specific social elements in social marginalizations and inequalities. That's why Banji will continue on in regards to the dynamics on local governments. The inclusion of technocratic social sciences is apparent across countries in spite of different historical trajectories and the inclusion exclusion of critical social sciences that have used researches to respond to direct needs within their communities or ally with journalists and national mass media uh, to be marginalized and excluded from these processes of policy making and policy responses. That's why we would like to place of local governments in which there is a wider space or boundary opening for local actors and social sciences and the academia to ally with communities that have resulted in local initiatives, um, local initiatives that also partner with some local governments. Banji, over to you. Time and place is yours. Thank you, Vinaya. Thank you very much for, for this uh, opportunity for us to uh, present our uh, research. I think my presentation maybe will uh, will be stressing on, uh, especially the case of Indonesia. And previously, Inaya explained about the uh, division between the life and health science and also the social science uh, in responding the the pandemic. But quite interesting if we refer to case of Indonesia and uh, to a certain extent also the Malaysian case inside of political science, uh, inside of the social sciences uh, itself, we found also uh, a quite interesting division between the let's say the two strokes of uh, social science orientation based on the uh, their involvement in in uh, responding the the COVID-19. And we uh, call uh, the, the first uh, orientation, we call as the technocratic uh, orientation and 
So the second one is the critical orientation of social science uh, involvement in in policy making. So uh, I think uh, for the mostly for the technocrat technocratically uh, oriented social scientists, uh, they uh, usually have uh, direct access to policymakers, and they typically join state agencies in dealing with the pandemic either as the member of uh, uh, expert teams, for instance, or by leading a research commission by state agencies. I think uh, here in Indonesian context, there is two leading uh, state agencies who uh, play an important role in providing social science recommendation to the government. The first one is the, the COVID-19 task force, and the second one is the, the Ministry of uh, Research and Technology uh, of the Republic of Indonesia. And uh, the second orientation, we call it as the the most uh, uh, the, the the critical uh, social scientists. Uh, the, this group of social scientists are excluded from uh, bureaucratic channels and articulate their criticism to the government policies through uh, various uh, channeling, uh, such as the op opinion features in the media, national media interviews, webinars, and uh, social media. And I think it is quite interesting if we found that, uh, for instance, in one uh, state agency called the Task Force for uh, COVID-19 in Indonesia, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the, the, this uh, state agencies consisted uh, 81 uh, members from various disciplines as the expert teams, and uh, from the from the social scientists is only six members. It's, uh, we can we can see from this data that. The, the social science uh, for this context is, is quite uh, excluded from, from the involvement in, in, in policy making. So I think uh, the second one, uh, as Inaya mentioned previously, there is also uh, interesting uh, interactions between uh, researchers and uh, policy makers. And uh, we found uh, in Indonesia, as we know, as a decentralistic state, uh, there is, uh, of course, a various and different uh, responses in in if we if we compare between the central government and also the the local governments. So uh, we usually uh, 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 from our interviews uh, we identify that uh, mostly our our informant uh, uh, say that the Indonesian government embark on a series of uh, con confusing half-hearted and also erratic policies, stressing on issues uh, on uh, economic protection rather than uh, health consequences. So it, this is quite interesting be because the critical uh, social scientists and their, their allies from uh, non-governmental organizations uh, argue that the government's policies response so uh, anti-science un, un, anti tendencies. So I think um, uh, the scientific rec recommendation from uh, social scientists, especially from critical uh, social scientists, are perceived by, by the government as normative and, and impractical, difficult to operationalize into clear intervention strategies to help the government uh, to handle the, 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 the crisis. So uh, if we uh, look at the uh, deeper to the local government, the Indonesia context, also the response is uh, quite pari because uh, it depends on the resources they, they have. If they have a uh, uh, local budget quite quite uh, uh, good, maybe they can, they can uh, operationalize and implement uh, uh, good policies, but uh, in the context that they have no uh, not enough uh, resources, maybe uh, their, their, their response is quite limited. So I think uh, from regions to regions, the, the, the response is quite pari. And I think uh, it depends on the, on the, on the factor of uh, the authority and also the power relations within and between the central and uh, the, the local government. So I think that uh, Inaya, you can continue, please. I hope my connection is stable because it's it's raining here. I'll continue on what Panji mentioned. Because there are var variations of power relations on the level of local governments, we can see local initiatives in which uh, intellectuals ally with communities, like in the case of Sonjo in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, in which economists from 
uh, Universitas Gajah Mada uh, create platforms on Messenger to organize uh, basic services, uh, more direct access uh, to health services, basic services, employment, education. Uh, and there's also the three day children training to provide food, which is based on the left movement of people. And in Malaysia, there are digital platforms that provide work um, uh, opportunities for those who are precarious. These initiatives um, occur largely outside of state intervention. They are driven by critical social sciences, and I'm latching on to what Elnaz mentioned as stateless. It's grounded on neoliberal, uh, the neoliberal agenda in which every people, every person fends off for themselves and need to find alternative access basic services. I return here to Burroway's 2005 uh, speech as well as his most recent discussion about the pandemic in which he um, makes uh, the argument that social scientists uh, during the pandemic in which socialists are worsening uh, are also complicit and inevitably uh, reproduce the very structures in which uh, our organizations, our neoliberal universities, privilege certain researchers over the other. Researchers that uh, are very specific to the project or are speaking of a micro community, despite them being uh, extremely marginalized or digital opportunities as well as publication avenues. This way we like to problematize the terminologies that are so often flagged around, such as inclusive governance and resilience, because we very much see that this masks the actual class um, um, issues, the class tensions between those with various elements of minority across race, gender, sexual orientation, um, ethnicity, uh, religion, the list goes on. Um, uh, including those who are not citizens, like in the case of Singapore, uh, Indian migrants are the most affected by the pandemic. So the way social inequalities emerge, while it's grounded in the neoliberal effect that is worsened by the pandemic, they manifest in different ways because of the very specific kind of displacements that every person experiences. Uh, we agree with Elnaz's presentation regarding precarity and this mass um, relationship that normally on uh, behalf of mass theory for the secure employment even if we're precarious we have the technical and intellectual skills to capture other work opportunities and he's active to be willing to as clearly in our direct material conditions we are not hence we vouch for a birth theoretical engagement that is interlinked and that is um, uh, symbiotic with our political praxis in our communities, in the people we uh, feel um, closest to and most relevant in our work in which our research participants and ourselves as researcher are one. And we would like to have the aspirations to widen this social space for discussion and allying with academics across the region because it's not enough to speak within our own institution very much hijack. Difficulty hearing you, Anaya. <laughs> It is hard rain in Jakarta, I think, Professor. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my connection is unstable. Do I have permission to close for one minute? Sure. <laughs> uh, so I hope it's not too far-fetched to end the presentation with hopes that our praxis has 
uh, potential to contribute to widen the social space for academic and praxis, academic discussions and practice, praxis uh, with an effect of redistributing access and power as much as material condition permit to as many people who in very specific ways experience social exclusion during the pandemic and beyond. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, too, Pine. Thank you very much indeed. We're right on time and I can see some uh, themes emerging here and I look forward to dis the discussion. I'll just remind the audience once again, don't forget to jot your questions down in the p a box. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce our last speaker, um, Professor Fleur Johns is a professor in the Faculty of Law and Justice at New South Wales University in Sydney, Australia, working on international law, legal theory, uh, and law and technology. She is an Australian Research Council Future Fellow, a visiting professor at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, and a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. The paper is entitled Modeling and its Discontents, the Value of Complementary Knowledge in a Pandemic. Thank you, Flo. Thank you so much, Chris, and, um, and thank you also to Michelle and Anna and everyone involved in organizing the conference. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I'm speaking with you tonight, our time from Sydney, at the, on the, un, from the unceded lands of the Bejical people of the Eora Nation. It's as um, Chris said, I think some themes are really emerging and my paper will, I think, really flow quite beautifully from the prior two papers in that what I'm talking about today is the instantiation in a particular social knowledge form of some of the inequalities and tensions that they've been um, so beautifully drawing out. So this, um, I'm just going to share my screen. This paper is, um, I'm speaking with uh, to a chapter that is forthcoming in a, or is out actually already in a book entitled Pandemic Exposures, Economy and Society in the Time of Coronavirus, edited by Marion Foucard and Didier Fassin and published by How Books. And if anyone wants a preprint, I'd be very happy to send them. Just email me and I'll send you a PDF. Um, and that paper really um, addresses the um, following. Uh, sorry, one second. I'll just reshare. I seem to have a minor glitch. Apologies. Um, so I'll just reshare. So the paper that I'm speaking with uh, to this um, addresses this question here on the screen now. Um, what understandings of social life or configurations of social relation have been promoted by the widespread practice of modeling? And I'll speak more about what type of modeling I'm talking about in a moment of the COVID-19 pandemic and the instantiation in models of certain assumptions about social life and their expression in law and policy that rests, um, derives its rationales in part from those models. And the conclusions that I reach and the argument um, that I make in the paper is for the value of cross-cutting and complementing modelling practices with complementary and, and times antagonistic forms of social knowledge making, um, of, uh, which include uh, the types of immersive social knowledge making that um, the prior papers were alluding to, uh, qualitative social science and forms of knowledge making associated with the creative arts and the humanities and so forth. Um, so that's where I'm heading. Now, as I, um, as I describe in the paper, I'm talking about um, a phenomenon that's manifest obviously at the level of the body in the form of illness and death, but it's also manifest very widely in terms of the public um, digestion of uh, uh, not modelled knowledge and, and, to, and secondary reporting on and from models. And 
the models in question have been multiple. Um, so I'm talking about scientific and mathematical modeling, such as SIR and SEIR, modeling of contagion, genetic modeling of mutation, um, and interactome models of virus host interactions and, and other sorts. Um, but importantly, this has been in constant iterative interaction with economic modeling of different scenarios. And here I give an example of the work by OECD economists, um, the modeling certain types of pandemic effects that could be perhaps foreshadowed using the NIGEM econometric model, which is often treated as a global model, but is derived from the data from 46 countries and regions, including just one from Africa. And that in turn was in continual dialogue with a much less professionalized practice of, of modeling, of social modeling, which involves uh, a practice of framing policy and public discussions around certain national archetypes um, and comparing them, their merits and demerits. Um, so we see this, for instance, in the many references made to the Swedish model or the Singapore model. Um, so this is obviously a much less professionalised, but nonetheless pervasive uh, form of modelling that is in dialogue with um, economic and scientific and mathematic modelling. And each of these variants of modelling is subject to different priorities and criteria for usability. So what counts as a usable or workable model in one mode will not obviously count as a usable or workable model in another mode. And yet they are in constant interaction and often the differences between them and um, their criteria for usability are not articulated, um, at least not in public and policy discussions surrounding these models. So the example I give in the paper of an output that um, flowed from these modelling practices are social distancing laws and policies, which are familiar to all of us, no doubt, that I'm talking about all the laws and policies that were designed throughout the world to try and keep bodies apart, um, which included those that mandated the closure of certain businesses and um, restrictions on individual movement and collective gathering and so forth. And these are, as you know, very varied, although as I'll, say, I'll suggest in a moment, they actually converged around a relatively narrow range um, and they were policed quite intensively and um, sometimes violently, and as many studies have shown, often very unevenly. In my own city, recent studies have suggested that there's been disproportionate policing of the poor um, in recent times, and similar dynamics have been illustrated elsewhere. So these social distancing laws are obviously expressions or outputs of public law, of legislative processes, and the exercise of executive power under public law. And they are also expressions of private law because in many instances, their enforcement has involved contracting out. So contract rights and liabilities have been, um, and backed by state law, um, have been um, significant in um, giving rise to these forms of regulation. But the argument of the paper is that they are also outputs of modeling practice. So we can almost understand these dynamics of modeling as a parallel regulatory the governance um, process or set of processes. So for instance, the modeling of mucosalivary respiratory droplets uh, gave the uh, rationale for social distancing. And, and that was a dynamic process. So initially um, the models that tended to prevail were those that focused on respiratory models of relatively large size um, back to the 1930s. And then um, the modeling of micro droplets, sub micron droplets that were aerosolized later uh, gave rise to more emphasis upon ventilation and masking and so forth. So um, this is not a one shot process, this is a kind of continuous iteration between these processes. And yet um, social distancing can be understood at least in part as a product of that practice of scientific modeling. It can also be understood as a, pro and a product of economic modeling in that, um, the policy making process involved the continual modeling and testing out of what might be conceived as socially tractable or economically saleable models and their impacts. And similarly, it can be understood as an output of the type of non-professional social modeling that I was describing earlier, because there, uh, when you look around the world at social distancing regulation, there is perhaps surprising convergence on this one to two meter um, range 
despite the fact that, as I said, that aerosolized, aerosolized droplet modeling doesn't necessarily support that because it shows that, model, that droplets travel much greater distances. And yet the tendency to kind of pull a policy off the national shelf and to view um, policy options in national containers tended to support this convergence around a relatively narrow range. And you also saw some mimicry in enforcement practices, um, both hard in terms of often sometimes violent policing and soft um, in, in terms of guidance and, and uh, best practice and so forth. So these, why does it matter that we um, think about social modelling as a regulatory practice? It matters because of the ways in which these models instantiate Set what I describe it as centres and cores. So the worlds of COVID-19 models have certain recurrent characteristics, and these pick up on some of the themes uh, from prior papers. So I'm going to talk about their core characteristics, their recurrent characteristics, and then the peripheries that those characteristics create. So the worlds of COVID models tend to be pro-social in that they incline model units towards one another and highlight reciprocal impacts, both beneficial and harmful. They tend to be presumptively humanly governable. So modelled worlds have humans at their centres and their helms. And that's not, that needn't necessarily have been the case because after all, we were talking about a zoonotic disease to start with. Um, but nonetheless, the modelling tends to presume the efficacy of human governance, um, that borders may be closed, that bodies may be rearranged in space and time. Uh, within relatively um, tight categories, nations and genders, for instance. Modelled worlds are also monotemporal. They presume that everyone occupies the same temporal framework. Um, so all those represented by proxy in a model are presumed to be equally present or absent in the same time frame. And I'll come back to uh, what that, what types of temporality that might, uh, that. Um, cast to the side in a moment. And modelled worlds are also event oriented. So the pandemic tends to have been modelled um, as an event in the relatively short term. And this is partially a consequence of the limits of um, predictive algorithms that you can own in public health, for instance, if you run them over too long a time span, they become less and less reliable. And so, um, so this in turn, this uh, modelling of the pandemic as an event tends to encourage reactions that are framed as counter events. So reactions of a relatively staccato finite nature. And this um, brings legal and policy measures introduced in the face of the pandemic neatly under the umbrella of emergency measures, often um, prompting recourse to extraordinary powers that were designed for disaster or armed conflict. And again, this is not, these not, need not have been the case because as many studies have shown it's possible to view the pandemic as a consummation of a very long-term set of processes rather than just a shock event um, as um, was drawn out in the prior papers. So what about the peripheries of these these model worlds? Well we could talk about many but let me just highlight a few. So on the peripheries of pro-sociality we have all those who, presume, who experience social isolation as a matter of routine or experience themselves as isolates. So I'm thinking here of the work of the Japanese labor economist Yuji Genda um, and his work on solitary non-employed persons, as he describes them, who enact uh, complete social withdrawal. That would be an example of a group of people who find no ready place for themselves in the model world that most uh, was traded most widely, model worlds that were traded most widely um, during a pandemic, um, because the presumption was that solitude and isolation was a temporary state. Um, and the presumption was that um, people would be would be best um, uh, made best supported by entering into a temporary state of isolation and then emerging from it, rather than for some that would have been a continuance of an ongoing state. At the periphery of their prioritization of human governability are all those human bodies that are not easily categorized as a matter of gender or nationality or are in motion among these governing categories. So um, prior presentations talked about refugees and asylum seekers as one illustration of those caught between models um, and not 
really addressed or um, contemplated, accommodated within any modeling practice. At the periphery of monotemporality, we can think of the way that anthropology, um, the work of novelists and musicians and historians have drawn attention to the heterogeneity of time, um, the temporal diversity and hybridity that characterises people's experiences of the time space that they occupy and their relations to past, present and future. And this uh, hybridity and heterogeneity finds no place in a model world. It is cast to the margins. And at the periphery of models event orientation um, are the, all the ways in which we could understand the pandemic as the culmination of non-historical processes, uh, such as deforestation, habitat destruction, the underfunding or um, paucity of public health care. So non-emergency long-term policy changes and causal factors tend to be set aside by modelling practice. So the paper does not offer a solution to this politics of modelling. It, um, it proposes a kind of engagement in this politics, and it certainly doesn't advocate abandoning modelling it or, do, or try to correct any particular model. Um, what it does is offer two ideas or around this paper. I've also offered two ideas for um, the role of qualitative social science and other forms of knowledge making in complementing and cutting across the limits of um, modelling practice, particularly for policy making purposes. So the first idea is that one could imagine building a broader um, a more eclectic repertoire of public engagement around this regulatory process. And we've had, we have um, rituals and and repertoires of public engagement around other lawmaking and governance processes, around legislative processes in parliamentary settings, around um, judge-made law in open courts, for instance. So we can think of, and these often, um, those rituals and repertoires often draw on practice, practices from theatre and historical knowledge about how you engage people. It's, uh, you know, the iconography of, of public engagement around these processes is very rich. And we can think of building a repertoire around modelling that would be comparably rich. And that would require, I think, um, a higher level of um, public and governmental engagement with um, non-modelled forms of social knowledge making um, around pandemics, such as the forms of knowledge associated with quality of social science and humanities and creative arts that would tell some of the stories of the peripheries that I've been um, drawing your attention to. But I look forward to our discussion. There's so many interactions between these papers, so I'm looking forward to our discussion and your questions. Thank you so much. I'm new. Well, thank you very much. Um, there's um, obviously lots of connections and ideas here for discussion. Um, we have one question and uh, I, it's been answered, but I think we should bring it out into the open. And so, uh, Siri Hettig, are you there? No. <laughs> Siri? Anyway, I'll read her question. Since we are still in the midst of the pandemic, would it be useful for a small group of participating social scientists to work on a communique that embodies the key concerns and insights that paper presenters brought to be shared with, with the option, with the opinion makers and policy makers? So, um, Inaya, would you like to elaborate on your answer for the benefit of the people on the webinar? Uh, thank you, uh, Siri, for the question, and also Professor Chris Gregory. Um, uh, I think uh, allying with like-minded uh, academics and public intellectuals um, is very, very important in these times to mobilize um, any material and immaterial resources that we have. Uh, but first, we need a common agenda. Uh, what we want to uh, achieve together. And that, of course, requires a social process. Um, 
through uh, the uh, support of the Global Development Network, who did so many legwork for uh, scholars and academics in Southeast Asia who are also uh, directors of centers or heads of departments. They have dozens of students they are supervising. Um, having GDN as the host um, really was uh, crucial to uh, keeping us together and maintaining the momentum. Um, because the way uh, academia is organized um, uh, currently is in silos per discipline, uh, per university uh, uh, direction and student and research income. Uh, and even if we have some kind of semblancy of agency within our universities, we are hindered with those kinds of instruments. So having an independent party hosting and maintaining uh, that social process is crucial. Uh, back to you, Chris, thank you. Mm. Thank you, Anaya. Would any of the other, and I noticed that Siri has written here, I have a problem with my mic, sorry. So we're sorry too, Siri. So, and anyway, we might take that point up, but I'd, um, as an anthropologist, of course, we're interested in the, the comparative analysis. And what I find fascinating here, of course, when I listen to Fleur talking about models, you know, I, it's all very familiar for us in Australia. And what, what's interesting, I find, just in terms of a subjective feeling of what's going on, the economists have been pushed off the TV screens and the people now know what an epidemiologist is. <laughs> And uh, so, um, and they have a, a large say in Australia. And I'm just wondering if you could just tell us a bit of what is happening in Indonesia and um, in Iran. Are these, do you have these statistics and counts and all, all of this um, fetishization of the figures and numbers? Would you like to just tell us a bit of what is happening from, from your perspective? Well, talking about Iran, I think Dr. Roshan Fikri is uh, available and I think he can give a better answer. If you can maybe add him. Um, Payam, if you could um, share your, your video, then we'll be able to add you to the panel screen. Oops, uh, having problems there. Uh, here we are. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pian. Oops, where are, here we are. Good. <laughs> welcome on board. I uh, hope you've finished your teaching, have you? <laughs> Oops, you have your mic, you have to unmute. And you have a, uh, thanks. It's I, right down there. He's having a technical problem connecting with the mic. So this is brave new world of COVID-19 with communications. That's, um, and uh, so, and Siri writes, all papers are very insightful. Thank you very much. So Anaya or Panji, would you like to um, tell us a bit what's happening in Indonesia in terms of these models? Are you, is the epidemiologist a, a, a prominent, feature on the TV screens in terms of your technocratic um, processes? Yeah, uh, I'll go first and then Banji will continue. The answer mm -hmm. is yes, but mm -hmm. there's also, um, so yes, in terms of epidemiologists are uh, very widely cited uh, and it's, um, the numbers are indeed fetishized, not only in the form of modeling, but also in the form of uh, the mobilization of people through digital data. Um, uh, at the same time, though, some epidemiologists that are critical of the government are also being marginalized. Uh, these are the kinds of people who um, look at their data not only as uh, quantitative public health data, but also look at the outliers uh, and also some uh, aspects of political economy. 
these types of epidemiologists uh, ally with journalists and also loose networks of activism. And some have experienced uh, doxing. So doxing is the revealing of personal data for the purpose of intimidation. Uh, Banji, maybe you would like to ask, uh, add uh, to that. I think it's quite uh, similar with Inaya. I think uh, first, maybe in the beginning of the outbreak, I think the government uh, uh, pay more attention to the life sciences and health uh, and medical sciences also. But I think uh, mostly if we take some example of the, uh, for instance, epidemiologists or uh, medical doctors, also, part of them are also criticize uh, some of the government's uh, policies, for instance, like the uh, lockdown policies and also about the fact sign uh, policies. And I think it is quite interesting because some of them are also building an ally alliance with the with the critical social sciences and also the the the, the non governmental uh, organizations. So I think uh, at the end, I think. Uh, most people and public also uh, refer to this group of uh, uh, scholars. Uh, we can. It, it is quite uh, difficult to 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 devise between the positivistic and also the 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 qualitative uh, orientation in science uh, because uh, in practice uh, some of the life scientists and also the medical doctors also are also joining with the. With the critical social social sciences, uh, uh, Professor Tisgegori. Mm. Thank, uh -huh. uh, thank you. That's very interesting. We we'll just might uh, you, uh, to you, Fleur. Would you like to just add up? Uh, I found it, this. I agree with you there about the. You know, we don't want to push these people away, but it's about being you know, the, the, the qualitative and the quantitative and. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about these the complementary knowledge that you talk about and what can social sciences contribute alongside this mathematical and scientific modelling. Sure, thanks, Chris. And I actually had a question for um, my fellow panellists, if I right. might. Um, so, okay. yes. So, for example, the uh, one of the types of life experience that I described as peripheral in most modeling um, scenarios. Obviously lots, there's a wide diversity, so I'm, I'm sure there are um, some that wouldn't correspond to this, but um, is the idea of people who experience or the experiences perhaps we all experience a sense of heterogene heterogeneity in temporal terms. So this is um, anthropology has really uh, done a lot of work on uh, the ways in which traumatized communities, for instance, inhabit the past in their daily life. So the past is present in their daily life in a way that um, it's not for other communities. Um, so I think anthropo anthropological accounts of the diversity of timescapes that people occupy would be one illustration of a complementary knowledge form that would have something to say about the pandemic that modelled knowledge wouldn't offer. And why would that be relevant? Because if you're asking people to um, take significant changes in their life over a certain time frame, and assuming that they will be able to endure that and look forward to a future in, uh, with a promise of um, greater freedom and stuff, you, ca you can't necessarily presume that all communities will be able to, uh, will be oriented towards that future and will respond to the same policy levers and incentives around uh, to encourage them to, um, to comply. So understanding the different timescapes that people occupy, not obviously individualized, but on a community level and understanding how some communities might find it harder to endure um, a particular a radical period of radical isolation and to be oriented towards the future and might see this more in terms of past experience and past trauma um, could perhaps inform targeted or more uh, community um, co-designed 
uh, measures that would be attentive to that. So that's one illustration of how seemingly kind of irrelevant knowledge can be really relevant for um, the sorts of purposes uh, that, um, that policymakers were, uh, the sorts of dilemmas that policymakers were facing. But I had a question for my fellow panelists because both of you, both of the papers talked about um, the extension of neoliberalism. And I found that compelling. I, and I think that your, the emphasis upon self-help and resilience is, a, is um, a great illustration of that. So I, I'm persuaded. But I was also thinking about um, the early stages of the pandemic, uh, the appearance in the popular press of a narrative about the end of neoliberalism, that we're all Keynesians now, um, and also about the limits of competition, you know, the need for redundancy to be built in. So I wondered if that was present in Iran and Indonesia, and if so, what you make of that, that sort of popular sense, perhaps inaccurately, that neoliberalism had somehow come to an end in the pandemic. Good question. Thank you very much. Um, Anji, Anaya, Anayas. Payam, are you, can you get, you're still uh, muted. Are you still having difficulties? <laughs> uh, uh, Elna? Well, from what I know, there wasn't much uh, at the beginning of the pandemic in the newspapers, whether about the end of neoliberalism or like uh, its continuation. Uh, it was, well, we're all anti-capitalist, so it was kind of like uh, something happening far away and the Western governments were failing to deal with it. So it kind of uh, sounded like a big success, but then the pandemic came to the country and the whole discourse changed. Uh, but but it was never formulated in that way. In the case of Indonesia, maybe Baji would like to add as well. There were uh, two laws passed very quickly, uh, accelerated during the pandemic. Uh, so it was a political process that was prioritized because it was in the interest of the political elites. One was the omnibus law bill that legalized casualization of labor uh, before the Ministry of Human Empowerment Man Manpower um, um, legalized um, uh, secure employment after two years of consecutive work. Now that law no longer exists. So a person can be employed on a contractual basis for the rest of their lives. The law also legalized uh, some parts of continuing uh, the extractive industries. Uh, so some effects on the environment in the name of economic recovery is continuing. Uh, the second law that was passed was the uh, national um, science and technology law in which uh, the centralization of all research and development across ministries are now under one body. It's called BRIN, uh, the National Agency for Science, uh, Research and Innovation. Um, and LIPI, formerly LIPI Institute for Indonesian Sciences, is now under uh, this one super agency. Some uh, media reports, like from Science Magazine, uh, cited uh, and noted the fact that on the board of um, advisor is uh, the chairman, not the chairperson, chairwoman of uh, the BRIN is also the chairwoman for uh, the Pancasila ideologization body. So it's the uh, state uh, development um, paradigm and ideology uh, that was instrumental during the authoritarian government. Uh, the chairperson is also the leader of the uh, PDP party, uh, who currently supports the uh, incumbent, uh, incumbent president. Um, so this is a recent movement uh, in which um, we would argue predatorial politics and neoliberal agenda uh, have married and created new kinds uh, of innovative, but no less marginalizing avenues for social sciences. Anji, would you like to add anything? Yeah, 
maybe a little bit uh, thank you uh, professor jones for your question i think it's quite interesting to to see because previously i i also thinking at the same thing like like you because uh, uh, we found that uh, the the pandemic uh, i think uh, 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 contributes to a multi layer uh, inequality in terms of uh, the first one it's uh, uh, between the the, the life science and also the health science, the positivistic science versus the ideographic and uh, uh, social science. And the second one, it, it, inside uh, of uh, social science itself, we we also uh, found the, the division between the technocratic one and also the critical uh, uh, social scientists in responding the, the situations. And also the, the, uh, the last one is, uh, I think, it, we can we can see also the response of the government to to the to the issue to this issue. If we uh, taking back to the to the last year's uh, uh, Indonesian's government's uh, responses, we found that uh, uh, the government uh, the the first uh, direction from the government to to the researcher in Brin in the the the, the innovation and technology uh, agency is how to conduct. Uh, the research in dealing with the economic recovery. And this research found that the most important thing is how the government try to try to propose the digital economy to help uh, like small and medium enterprises. And I, I think there is a three key, three, 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 three key uh, crucial issues, I think, uh, from the government. The, at the the developmentalist uh, paradigm, they try to uh, they try to uh, promote in dealing with the pandemic. The first one, the, the economic uh, recovery. Uh, the second one is uh, the how they deal with the uh, entrepreneurialism, and also the, the third one is the the acceleration or digitalization of uh, the digitalization of economy. So I think this is in line with the 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 effort of the state to how they can deliver uh, a part of their responsibility to to the public so that that i think uh, uh, one crucial finding from from our our our, our research thank you professor john thank you very much that's very interesting um, we haven't got any on the Q and A, but we've got some interesting comments and a few questions. It looks like on the chat, um, Siri has an, a comment which I'll read, and there's another question we'll come to. But Siri from Sri Lanka says, "Political space available to critical social scientists varies across the regions. This is a major issue that social social science have to grapple with. This is a sensitive sensitive issue that cannot be easily resolved in some countries." I think we would. All agree with that. Thank you for that comment, Siri. And there's, uh, I think it's a question here from Edward Rodrigo. Besides the communique, which is a great idea, what other steps could social sciences take to make themselves heard? Again, excellent question. Are research councils talking to central governments? Are you talking to the local media? The campaign would require concrete, explicit examples where the models used in fighting COVID 19 have been flawed. So again, I'll open that to all of you. Thank you for that question, Edward, Edgar. And some... If I may. Yes, and I agree. Uh, uh, oh, uh, 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 you go first. Anaya, thank you. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> um, we had the discussion internally across our authors um, during our validation workshop to compare our findings. And we agreed that uh, it's one thing to have uh, the capacity for rapid response, but without a common theoretical agenda, an academic agenda, it would be fleeting because there's no social basis to continue on that momentum when resources no longer exist. So the steps that we are taking is we are writing a thematic issue uh, on COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. 
Uh, we are also uh, carrying out collaborative webinars. Uh, some of the authors are mobilizing their institutional resources to carry out national webinars with their uh, allies, either policymakers or uh, labor unions. That's in uh, the Philippines, in Thailand, uh, Asia, the Asia Research Center is allying with Sea Junction, Southeast Asia Junction, and we're doing a regional uh, webinar um, uh, together with uh, Professor Kian Wun from uh, Nanyang Technological University. So these are the social processes that maintain the same uh, key message across different uh, scholars within different institutions. And then we, the next step is to have an edited book uh, and we can carry out long-term uh, regular reflections in regards to uh, the baseline data that we already have. So we very much see this as a social process. At the very core, it takes trusting the people you're writing with so that it doesn't become instrumentalized or uh, an object uh, that is passed around without uh, accountability. Uh, so um, uh, we stand on Burroway's argument and would like to pick up on that in our praxis. Panji, do you have anything to add? Enough, Inaya. Yeah. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, Elna? Um, um, uh, yes. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm coming from uh, two different contradictory backgrounds. One of them is uh, human rights. And like uh, it's about legal actions and top-down actions, and the other one is anthropology. And personally, Edgar's comment kind of reminded me of my disappointment with all uh, top-down actions and how they are being delayed because the very bodies that uh, push them forward are the reason that we are in the current situation. And uh, personally, I think. We have to start working with grassroots movements. We have to start learning from communities that are organizing themselves. And we know that the corporations and INGOs and like global governing bodies are quite quick to devour these movements and act as gatekeepers and uh, like reappropriate their discourse. But uh, I think as at least anthropologists, I'm not talking about everybody in uh, the social sciences spectrum. Uh, we can start by going back to the publics and like uh, learning from what they did. And I remember reading about this very interesting uh, experience and um, I don't remember the community, but uh, the community had learned how to contain Ebola by themselves and their, their um, method was actually more useful than the method that was being forced by the government. And I think there are numerous uh, examples of that, that we should learn from and we should follow in the footsteps of grassroots movements. We should, we should, uh stop taking side with those in power and like uh instead try to uh take side with those uh whose voice has been um silenced for long thank you very much um just the your answer there's a number of a couple of questions but we're running out of time so i'll just read the questions and you may like to type answers because we've got, by my reckoning, uh, about 40 seconds to go. But we have another question there or as a comment from Siri from Sri Lanka. In some countries, the management of the pandemic and related issues has been highly centralized with little room for local institutions to play a significant role. What has been the result? Another question from Bahi Rathi. Uh, a critical aspect of El Nas division of social sciences, new outcomes of social exclusions as a result of neoliberal manifestations in the pandemic and the non-models forms of from social knowledges of some connection or do we land to, to into transdisciplinary approach that we knew already depending upon issue in our hand as said economics which is intellect and permeated is somehow excluded so thank you very much for those two questions um, we are now uh, our time is up and um,
I'd like to thank the questioners and, of course, thank the, the three speakers for a very um, wonderful presentation on all three cases, which were, we are all on the same page in many respects. So there's some interesting questions there for um, um, to, to catch up on. And um, so now it's my duty to uh, to announce the close of session five, but don't go away. We have to introduce Professor James Fox, the president of ASREC, who will provide the closing remarks. Professor Fox, over to you. All right, well, I thoroughly enjoyed this last session. Um, I come, as do some of you as well, from an anthropological background. And um, I was thoroughly um, enthused by what was being said and, um, and, and the different points that were being made. Now, I have an impossible task um, because what I'm supposed to do now in, in just a few minutes is try to say something about the entire conference. And I think it's, it's virtually impossible for me to rehearse all the things that have been discussed. I have been sitting here for three days in my office um, and been listening to uh, papers from the first day to the present. And really, it has been a wealth of different perspectives. And I think given what has been said here in this last session, it's important to look back at some of these earlier sessions and just to recognize the enthusiasm that was expressed in terms of so many different disciplines of the social sciences. Um, and, and, I, and I just I made a list here of just different, different fields that have all been presented in the course of uh, these last three days. We've had international relations. We certainly had political science. We've had economics and finance. Um, we've had anthropology and, and, and surprisingly, it's leavened uh, the discussions throughout this, this conference. We've now had public sociology. We've had social, social studies and human studies. We've had management and communication. Uh, we've had law. We've had areas of social welfare, environmental law, and gender studies. So it has been extraordinary. And I have to say that every presenter, without exception, gave their fullest and presented their perspective on what what they they felt as as very as very important to their work and important to an understanding of of COVID nineteen and both practically and in in critically in the sense of what they succeeded in doing and what was not successful. All of this has been part of this extraordinary conference that we've been we've been attending. We've talked about international political rivalry, uh, especially that the COVID crisis, the COVID pandemic occurred in coincidence with an increasingly polarized rivalry between superpowers. And that's something that has to be taken, to, taken to, into account at uh, an international level. Uh, that certainly colored the whole of our dealings with the COVID pandemic. We've talked also about the possibilities this opens for new spaces of uh, multi multilateralism at the international level. We've looked at geopolitics, but also at biopolitics, 
We looked at the formulation and monitoring of public interventions and then the policy consistency. And, and, and I think for those of uh, the Indonesians here, there was a very good talk on what a single policy inconsistency can do for disrupting uh, compliance because that inconsistency really undermined almost everything else. At least that was the argument. And I, and I was partially convinced uh, um, by that. We had a discussion of social capital and this in regard to the Hmong. This is a very small group of people in Vietnam who have had to completely organize their migration patterns because of COVID, they're not able to cross the border into China. And therefore, they have developed their own community uh, ways of, of, of migrating, avoiding the government program. And there was a discussion of how this all linked up into social, into social capital bonding and bridging and limit and, and linking. But we also had a discussion of coping strategies. There have been many different coping strategies by marginal groups and by and by mainstream groups in dealing with the with the COVID. It has been a time of COVID. Um, we've had discussion, and it was a very important discussion on social isolation. COVID is a socially isolating. If you have COVID, it's socially isolating. And that was a very important element that was discussed. Um, but at the same time, it was discussed in an Indian context with a discussion on spirituality and on, on uh, religiosity, which was, dis which was contrasted with spirituality and the importance of both in a multicultural society. We had, um, we had the a discussion of global competencies. Um, it's uh, an elusive idea, but it is, it is an idea which I think is fundamentally anthropological in the sense that it is about understanding other cultures and appreciating their worth and what they are about and the, the importance of, of cultivating these global uh, competencies. We've had a, a considerable discussion about um, inequalities, different kinds of inequalities. These are the things that came to the fore very, very prominently in COVID. This opened the eyes, if you needed your eyes opening, to what, uh, what inequalities exist throughout the world and within your own society. Um, we then had a discussion of infodemics and this is a very important thing in the discussion of knowledge. What we have had is in dealing with, and as I see it, and I, and I certainly agree with it, there's, there, we've had such a variety of perceptions. And so much of that has been presented publicly in public, in the public forums, but also in all sorts of manners of social and social media. So the, the COVID pandemic also produced a kind of infodemic uh, of information of helpful and non-helpful, uh, problematic information of every kind. And that is also in the nature of the world we live in now with an amazing kinds of communications, what we never imagined even two years ago. Even two years ago, these our, our capacities for communications have increased exponentially. So we've had all of that. We've had we've had. Uh, I, I could go on. I was particularly appreciative of this idea of a critical sociology. I, I would say it's, it, it goes beyond sociology. It's a critical anthropology. Anthropology has always been, and will always remain in part a critical science and it's it is that engine for understanding of 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 what we of of our place our place i mean this collectively in the world so having presented all this what's interesting to me is to see and we've had presentations from from Sri Lanka, 
um, uh, where Siri comes from. We've had presentations from India. We've had presentations from Indonesia, uh, from China, from Taiwan. We've had presentations from uh, Thailand. We've had presentations, well, the whole of Asia. And it's clear to me from this conference that um, no country has navigated in the same way. There have been many different forms of navigation. Some of the sex successful, some have been disastrous. But this navigation is something we can now look over our shoulders and say, this was, this was something we can learn from, this is something we can avoid. But this navigation process is something that's, in fact, I think it will be ongoing for, for years to come. All of that said and done, social sciences, there is no doubt that social sciences have played a uh, enormous part. I don't see any more even the possibility of a dominant mode of, 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 of the use of knowledge. I think only by what, what Fleur was saying, you know, a very broad repertoire of public engagement in many different modes is that we go forward. But I think also what is important to emphasize, at least in my mind, because much of my work is on the environment, I think the COVID pandemic has only been a kind of prelude, a short preface to the much bigger global problems that we now face. These are challenges of the wickedest, wickedest kind. We have to deal with uh, climate change. Uh, we're, we're, we're ending this conference just as COVID begins in, in Scotland. And it is, it is the next and far more challenging uh, crisis that we face globally. Now, having said that, there are a couple things that I have to do and I want to do as, as the um, president of ASRIC in my final speech, if you want, as president of ASRIC. Um, I want to give it's my special pleasure to congratulate all our presenters on their excellent and insightful papers. Although these papers were focused on the COVID pandemic as a single topic, their diversity was remarkable. Together, they have provided an exceptional kaleidoscope of perspectives and analyses across Asia on our conference topic. The approaches taken in papers shows the depth, the development, and the importance of social sciences in Asia. And that's what we're about. I want to thank the chairs, Chris, and all the other chair, chairs that preceded you um, for your skillful management of these sessions. Their role was crucial to the success of each session. Your role was crucial to the success of each session and the discussion of the presentations we've enjoyed over the past three days. I also want to commend presenters for the quality and the clarity of their presentations. In a relatively short time, we seem to have gained new capacities and a remarkable degree of mastery in using a new mode of presenting and of contacting and communicating with each other. In other words, via Zoom. The technology has worked surprisingly well. I had feared that we would have glitches and problems. I would say it was almost flawless. And I want to thank Anne Dennis, who's there. Uh, she has, she's a member of the ASRIC Secretariat and she has worked brilliantly behind the scenes to see that everything went so well. The, point, the PowerPoint presentations that accompanied most of the papers were a substantial aid and enhancement. All of these contributed to the value of this conference. Finally, however, and very importantly, I want to thank our Secretary General, Michelle Bruce. 
who has spent months putting together this conference. Organizing a conference is never easy, but organizing the conference, this first Zoom conference of its kind for ASRIC has been particularly challenging. And I have to say, time consuming. Both personally and on behalf of those who have attended this conference, I thank Michelle. I hope she's there. I don't see it, but I hope she's there. So with that, I think we could end this session. And I would like to give applause to everyone.